I guess uh, this talk is mainly going to be about identifying bugs using the Waterbug app. Um, but I guess I, I'd like to start off the talk with a, a little bit of context for, for why we um, identify things the way that we do. Because as you're sort of mostly aware, I, I can see you're quite a diverse crowd of individuals out there. And some of you will have you know, more experience identifying these things than others will have. Um, so what I want to do, I guess, is set the scene for why we identify things the way we do. Because there's a whole bunch of different ways we could have done it. And um, you know, and whether we were right or not in the way that we did do it is is up for grabs. But um, we have a specific way of um, getting the ideas together. Um, is, there's this interesting noise there, Rich. Do you want to see if that's possible? Uh, yeah, I think I just caught that. Yeah, cool. Thanks, dude. All right. So I guess the very first part of this presentation will be a, a PowerPoint thing, a whiz through some slides, give you a bit of a feel for um, the context for um, the, the National Waterbug Blitz and the Waterbug app and the identification stuff that is that sits within that, I guess. Um, so, yeah, it's an intro to identification, but it's not like a, a laboratory based ID. It's not, you know, extremely formal uh, microscope based identification. This is for identifying stuff for the, either the National Waterbug Blitz or the Waterbug Census as Melbourne Water rolls it out. And they, they share the same taxonomic levels that they use for this sort of process. Um, the National Waterbug Blitz itself is a, a, a thing that's sort of nearing its end in terms of funding um, at the moment, but we're hopefully going to um, struggle on simply because we're associated with so many people, as you can see from this slide, every man and his or her dog. No, actually, every man would have to be a his dog. No, I've thought that out. Um, but anyway, uh, are involved in the project. Um, and it, it, it basically hangs off a whole bunch of identification work that um, I did with a couple of my colleagues, uh, Edward Serlin, who was one of the uh, was the co-author on the, the Waterbug book, and Tom Sloan, who is um, an eminent uh, taxidermist now, as opposed to a, a Waterbug person. He's moved on and um, is now, uh, yeah, quite a, quite a good, is a national champion taxidermist, in fact, um, and every now and then still deigns to help out with the odd bug ID when we go. But all of the work that I um, refer to, all the stuff that's in the app, all of the various ID stuff that we're inflicting upon you chaps, is the result of you know hard work from these two guys as much as it was from me. So I'm not slow, solely to blame, but I'm also not to take all the, all the credit. The Waterbug app um, is the thing that we're pushing as the main way of identifying animals for the programs that we just um, listed before. Um, if you're not a particularly appy person, and I have to admit myself to not being a particularly appy person, I hate the things, um, then what you might want to do is to chase down paper versions of the keys. So the actual, the, the keys for identifying animals exist by themselves in sort of a printable paper format. Um, and you can get them through the National Waterbug Blitz website on the resources page. Um, and they, yeah, they look a little bit different. I'll show you that later. But they are ostensibly exactly the same bits of literature, I guess, as you will find in the app. The one thing that the app has over the paper versions is that it can show you little videos of these animals. And I guess one of the reasons we ended up sort of IDing stuff the way we did is that the movement and the colour of live animals give you a whole bunch of clues that you simply don't get from dead preserved specimens. If you have ever seen dead and preserved specimens, you'll have noticed small things like the fact that they don't move at all and that they tend to be very, very pale. They'll often all the colour will drink, will sort of bleach out of them. Um, particularly the longer they're on the shelf, the, the more bleached they'll become. But very rarely, you know, do you get any any remnant of the original colouring of the animal. So if colour or movement are important or useful, you kind of lost that sort of stuff. So the cool thing about the app is it's got these little bits of video and these photographs, I guess, of live animals. So you can match them better to the animals that are in front of you when you're trying to identify things. Um, this is probably the sort of setup that we're kind of hoping that the Waterbug app will find itself in. It'll be um, either yourself and, you know, hopefully once the COVID stuff calms down a little bit, possibly other people sitting in a park around a table, hopefully with a net full of critters, that you want names for. And the app, um, I'm, I'm familiar with the fact that phones aren't totally waterproof and so bringing them near rivers isn't always the smartest thing to do. But um, uh, there are ways and means of keeping your phone dry. And so if you can sort of follow those precautions, um, it's actually safe enough to have it out. And um, once you've got a setup like this and you've started to uh, separate your animals out so that you're just looking at one animal and trying to find a name for that, um, you get, the, potent you get the, um, the possibility here for the app to guide you through the identification process like it is here. With these critters, 
um, what we've got, I guess, and for critters and for plants and for anything that sort of comes from the natural um, natural world, we've got um, these different layers. And most of you would be familiar with these. They're not they're not something I've just made up. They were put together by um, Linnaeus and Co. way way back, and we still use them today. And by far, the, the, the idea of species as being that the level that most people would like to identify to, um, it, it pre pre uh, persists, I guess, through sort of natural history world. And a lot of that comes about from the fact that we can do that for many things. You can identify most birds to species when you go looking at them. Most fish are obvious enough that you can identify them to species. Um, unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case for um, uh freshwater macroinvertebrates. Um, some of them are insects and some of them are crustaceans, which um, sort of pop in at these higher levels. Um, and, and what tends to happen is um, different sets of people are using different taxonomic levels, I guess, to, to look at freshwater invertebrates. And I'd just like to give you a bit of a feel, I guess, for, for the way different people are identifying different animals in the, the freshwater invertebrate landscape. So this is us, a greed level taxonomy. Um, I'll explain why it's called a greed level taxonomy in a, in a little while. Um, order level, that tends to be the sort of stuff that gets rolled out at school level. So it's the difference between dragonflies, dams, uh, sorry, dragonflies, mayflies, stoneflies, all those sorts of identifications tend to be at that order level. And we'll have a bit of a look at that in a minute. Um, some people just basically go out looking for mayflies. We've catered for that in the app. So if you see a mayfly, it is actually quite important information in terms of, you know, whether this bit of river is totally stuffed or only um, minorly stuffed. Mayflies can give you a good idea for water quality just based on their absence. Um, and then family level is the sort of level that uh, was traditionally rolled out for the government or, you know, the authorities' various um, water assessment projects that were put out um, back in the 90s. Um, so state authorities tend to run with that. Oz Rivers was a really good example of the family level stuff being used. And then I guess if you have um, a bunch of geezers that know their bugs really well and are interested in looking at the impacts at a certain site, genus and species level ID can be done in um, in laboratories with microscopes and specialized, specially trained individuals, I guess, to run those sorts of things. Um, species genus level is not actually all that much fun, I've got to say, on occasion. This is um, a little tray of critters that I'm working with at the moment from Papua New Guinea. And to identify these little fellows, I've basically got to whip their gonads out and have a look at them in 3D. And so this is very much um, minute sort of stuff that you've got to do under a microscope. You can see this um, filthy, filthy publication here on the right is basically just a page after page of pictures of hemiptera and penises. Um, and I, that's what I have to use to identify these things. Um, that is, I would argue, well beyond the, the, um, the sort of the scope of what we'd ask you chaps to do. Um, we're far more likely to do something different. So what we've got, I guess, is that the ALT stuff is very much not using microscopes. It is more likely to be using magnifying glasses like this. And by assuming that that's the way you're going to come to the, the table, I guess, and try and do um, water bug identification, we can instantly start um, uh, limiting what it is that we do in the keys, like this. Magnifying glasses are good. It doesn't mean that all your information is necessarily going to be coarse, though, because animals, um, particularly freshwater invertebrates, are many and varied. And some of the differences between them are actually, you know, quite, um, quite large, even at those lower resolutions. So this is... This is a pair of uh, water scorpions, and you can see that Renatra and Lacotrifes here basically are separable at the genus level. So you've got genus Renatra on the left and Lacotrifes on the right. So by if you can actually distinguish those from one another, and I'm tipping you probably can, um, you've instantly been able to make a genus level ID there. And that's something that, like I was saying before, isn't always possible. Sometimes it takes a microscope and it takes a whole bunch of you know minute dissection. But for some critters, we get lucky and there's this, this beautiful coarse level gross morphologies that actually give us a really good idea for whether the critters are different or not. Um, this is an example from the ALT keys, and you can see it's, it's, it's often um, not just in the gross morphologies. So this is two examples. It's a slender and a robust um, back swimmer. And they tend to be from, they are from two different genera. There's um, Anitheres is the robust and Anisops is the slender. And the really cool thing about these two critters is not only are they, you know, physically a little bit dissimilar, they, they are, one is small and one is robust, as the common names sort of suggest, but the other real, really cool thing about them is they have very different movements in the tray. So um, Anisops, the slender one, is actually able to uh, regulate its buoyancy and as a result will sit mid-water and has a much more relaxed, or appearingly, it appears to be a little bit more relaxed in its approach to life. Whereas Anitheres cannot regulate its buoyancy, so it does this thing where it's either on the surface filling up its um, air supplies, or it's 
tearing down to the bottom to hold on to something so it doesn't float to the surface again. So that's a much more hysterical sort of approach to the world. And that behavior just in itself gives you some really clues, really good clues for how to identify these animals. I just thrown that in to give you a feel for the sorts of things we're looking for. Um, in comparison, something like the amphipods tend to um, all look the same, I think is probably one of the, the best way to describe it. They do tend to have lots of legs. They tend to be um, anonymously sort of brown and green colors. The color's not, not consistently good for identifying things. There's a couple exception, of exceptions to that. Ostrochiltonia, one of the scenids, is often a lovely lime green or a lovely bright orange. And we're thinking of possibly using that to ID the map, but um, it's one of those things that's variable, so it's instantly not that useful because it's variable. Um, and so as a result, with the agreed level taxonomy stuff, we've left all of these chaps lumped together. They look roughly the same, so we leave them in the same group. Uh, I guess that should be giving you a bit of a feel for the way these agreed levels work there. Some of them are quite high level, some of them are quite low level, but all of them are put in because they are the level that we feel you can get to with a magnifying glass, if that gives you the context. The agreed level taxonomy stuff um, has its origins in our original Waterboat book, um, and it, it as a result, it uses, at the beginnings of the idea at least, really, really, really um, pleasantly simple characteristics that you can identify rapidly when you're looking at beasties. Things like, does it have legs? Doesn't it have legs? Really, really, really quick things. And then to actually achieve our agreed level tax, uh, our agreed levels with the taxonomy, what we did is we got a bunch of, um, in this case, Victorian Waterwatch um, coordinators, and we locked them in a room and we didn't let them out until they'd agreed that they could all identify something to a certain level. So we try and make them ID stuff to species level. And if they all consistently gave up at genus level, that was the agreed level that we decided we'd run with. So this is sort of a, a, a test bed, uh, if you will, that, that allows us to sort of draw a line under the taxonomic levels that are best when you're um, kitted out with a magnifying glass, limited time, and you know enough training to get somewhere, but not necessarily to do a, a full species or genus level ID for everything. I guess it's the way it originated. Um, this is the paper version of the ALT keys um, that I said is available out there. I think we're up to a different version now, up to about 1.4. Um, if you prefer paper to apps, this is the one to download. It's, it's available as a PDF. Um, and uh, unfortunately, if you print it out in color, it ends up costing about the same as a book. Um, but uh, if you have a workplace that you can um, print it out in um, legitimately, that's probably the way to go. Um, maybe you edit that out later, Rich. Um, all of the keys have gone from there, basically, into the Waterbug app. And so they're, they're, they're effectively the same tools um, in different packages, if you will. Um, underneath the, uh, the, this is sort of one of the, the, this is like the backbone, I guess, of the paper version. And I, I like putting it up as a hope because it gives you a feel for where you're going to go with your identifications. You can see um, up here that um, the, uh, the basically the different groups pretty much at order level or above separate out quite nicely just on their gross morphologies beetles are quite d easy to distinguish from bugs um if you're considering you know wing covers and that sort of stuff your wormy sort of critters all tend to hang out in this part of the key um your fly larvae which you know don't have legs and tend to be um you know fairly simple end up in there uh things even simpler than that like flatworms end up sort of separating out and and i guess i like to have this in the back of my mind whenever i'm identifying something because you can sort of uh you're, you're heading off into these clusters of similar organisms um but these really coarse level um splits are the sort of thing you have to almost be doing uh instinctively i guess once you sit down in front of an animal and things like the number of legs are, are, are very much you know the sorts of characters that are used at this kind of scale so I guess um, that was a little bit of a ramble. Um, the next bit of this is going to be a, um, a test of my abilities with technology. So hi, this is me again. I'm going to disappear briefly and hopefully be replaced with a couple of bugs and um, with a bit of luck, a, um, an access to a live stream of the app and what i'm intending to do i guess with this part of the talk is to try and uh, show you guys how i would uh, identify an animal um, the live one that's on screen using the app
um, and going through the various things. I'm going to start by um, just opening the app up. Um, uh, I apologize if this is too basic for a lot of you, but um, just showing how the, the data goes into the app is, is something that's kind of nice to get out there so you know what the, the framework, I guess, for, is for this thing. Um, this is the first or the opening screen for the app. Um, what we'd be doing to actually get data into the app for a, for a survey is hitting Waterbug survey like that. Um, we would be then either selecting a quick survey, which would be, remember how I said sometimes people do stuff to order level? That's that level where you distinguish dragonflies from mayflies, from caddisflies. So fairly simple IDs. If you wanted to do that, you'd hit quick. Um, I prefer to go detailed. And I guess even though you've dialed in detailed at this stage, you're not necessarily held to that. If you want to opt out early and just put in something at order level, there is the option for that in the keys. Um, the next thing we put in is uh, a brief description of the sort of habitat that you're dealing with. Um, most of my animals um, that I'm dealing with today come out of the, the little dam that I have at the back of my property. Um, with a couple of exceptions, there's some slightly nicer animals from the nearby um, uh, Northwest Bay Rivulet, which is, is really rather lovely. Um, but let's just say we're putting in wetland, then you type in um, uh, dam, you try and type in a, a meaningful name. I'm um, not going to bother because I'm not going to submit this. Um, and I, I put, uh, you know, John's place. Uh, excuse me. I just, uh, I, I'm filling these fields out because I kind of have to for the um, for the next screen to happen. Um, and then what we do is we, we put in a, a brief description of the sorts of habitats that um, the that were available at the site. Um, We've put this screen in because it's often kind of nice to see how the habitat uh, availability changes from sampling site to sampling, from sampling occasion to a sampling occasion. So if you go back to the same wetland, you might find that, you know, one year it's filled with macrophytes and the next year they've all disappeared. And your um, freshwater macro invertebrate assemblage that you'll get as a result of that will, will track those changes in habitat um, quite um, quite quite strongly. Um, you'll get a whole bunch of, you know, vegetation associated things when you've got the, the weeds there. Um, once they go, you'll, you'll end up with a different type of set of beasties. Um, just so I can get out of this screen, I'm just going to say it was 100% um, edge plants. You're not allowed to move them to the next screen until you've done that. Um, John, the, sorry, I've got a question coming through. Is there any chance of you putting the app image in the top right hand corner? It's obscuring the bugs. I can do that. How's that? Yes, great. Thanks. Um, I hadn't actually lined the bugs up just yet, so we'll, we'll see how we go. I may end up having to shuffle that round, depending on where the bugs go. Like if they now go off to the top right of the screen, we're, we're, we'll, we'll work with it. Um, OK, so assuming we we're going to identify one of these animals, I'm only going to go through the app properly once. The rest of the time we'll just do identifications. OK, so but bear with me. I'd, I'd like to do this one the proper way, I guess. Uh, so here's your virtual ice cube tray. For those of you that have done water watchy type things before, you'd be familiar with this particular piece of apparatus. It's how you get all your animals um, separated out into the different types. Generally, what happens is each of these cells, um, you know, will have a different beastie in it. And we've um, adopted that for the uh, background of the, the app. Um, if you are familiar with the names of all of your animals from the get-go, you don't actually have to key them. Some of you may be you know, good enough at this stuff to simply go into a list, and that's what you can do with this bottom one. Uh, if it's your first crack at this sort of thing, and you or you definitely want to you know, check that you're getting things right because it's an area that you haven't been to before, it's always advisable, I guess, to go through the key if you um, want to. The, um, the key starts exactly like the one in the book does. Um, this particular key, I guess what we'll do first is to run the... Does anybody have a preference? Or should we do the, the red one or the black one first? I might do the I'll do the red one first because it's a little bit um more um interesting. And then we can do the, the other chap later down. So animal with a shell, animal without a shell, it doesn't have a shell. By shell, we're sort of referring to a gastropody type setup, you know, like a, sna a snail would have. Um, not a crab carapace. That's a slightly different thing. Yes, it's a shell, but you know, it's one of those things where often the 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 lingo um, gets us in trouble here. With legs, without legs, we're definitely dealing without legs. Um, actually, that's these little chaps do have little nubbly bits just underneath their chins. They're actually pro legs. They're not proper legs. So when we refer to legs in the in the app just before, we're talking about proper legs um, with knees. I guess it's probably the best way to think of them. Whereas these pro legs are 
kneeless. They're stumpy little things. They're more like the legs that you find on a gummy bear, um, if that's a reasonable comparison. Probably isn't. Um, there you go. Uh, segmented versus unsegmented. One of the, fortunately, I think, I'm assuming the resolution that you can see these things is equivalent to what I can see. Um, and you can see that that little red chap does have a bunch of segments down his body. So we go segmented um, with suction cups or without suction cups. This chap is not suction cupping at all. So we go without suction cups. And then for this particular one, we have head with hard mouth parts or, or without hard mouth parts. If you can see on the left of the animal there, there's a little, uh, like a little motorcycle helmet shaped structure just above the little pro legs there. That is actually a head capsule and that holds the mouth parts that um, would be used to graze on algal filaments and that sort of stuff and decomposing bits of um, grot that it um, encounters in its um, sort of muddy habitat that it lives in at the bottom of um, wetlands and buckets basically in your yard. Um, and so it does have a hard head capsule. So we go with hard mouth parts. And at this level, um, we've come to one of those order level setups. Um, so this is the, the diptera, I guess. This is illustrated here by a simulid. But if you wanted to, you could just go, congratulations, you've got a maggot of some sort, a dipteran, and you could do an order level ID and stop there. We're going to be a bit clever and go further. At this point, it asks us whether maggots break the surface of the water to breathe um, or whether they don't need to contact with the water surface. So these are air breathers versus things that can breathe dissolved oxygen. And once again, I guess this is almost a behavioral characteristic rather than a physical, well, it is a physical characteristic, but it's it's easier to see from the behavior of the animal. This particular little fellow, the little red one there, is thoroughly sunk into the bubble of water and, and doesn't come to the surface at all the whole time we've been looking at him. So he's very much doesn't need contact with the surface. Um, in the next couplet, it asks whether it's a blef. Um, just to give you a bit of a picture of blefs, they look like, Lots of gummy bears stuck together. Um, and our chap is bright red, but um, not at all gummy bear-like. So we'll go not a bleph. Um, animal with a head capsule, long, thin, worm-like or leech-like. Animal without a head capsule. So we've definitely got the head capsule because I talked about it earlier. There we go, we move on. Um, animal moves like a leech, rarely losing hold of the substrate. Abdomen broadly swollen, giving it a chicken drumstick-like appearance. Expend ex Bandable antennae modified to form broad antlers for filter feeding, typical of fast flowing waters. This particular critter came out of a bucket in the garden, so um, I, it's not particularly fast flowing um, habitats. And he's distinctly not doing the um, chicken drum uh, body form, nor is he sort of suction cupping. So we'll go animal moves by coiling and uncoiling. He's done a little bit of it while you've been watching there, but he's not a particularly active chap. Um, but you can see from his body form that he would be able to coil and uncoil quite readily. He's sort of having a half. A very, very almost, almost coiling and almost uncoiling. So um, he's probably a bit knackered. He's been um, in this particular spoon for about an hour and a half now. Um, animals obviously red, animals not red. We're dealing with an obviously red animal. And you can see that that's taken us to bloodworm. Um, and this is basically a whole bunch of coronamids um, grouped in together. Most of them are from the genus Coronamus. Um, with the app, you do have the luxury of being able to see a little video of them and you can see that the two of them are quite quite similar you've got a little video playing up in the top right there and your real animal in life sort of sitting there so that's that's a, an id um to add it to the ice cube tray we hit this plus sign there um it then asks us to take a photo and also asks us to dial in how many we saw um we've just seen the one but in a sample you'd probably get you know anything upwards of 11 to 20 maybe more than 20 probably more than 20 most times you get to see these um, and then you tap this icon here to take a photo. Um, it's focusing on the bench and I'm not going to move it because I'll never get it in focus again. But if I was being good, I would um, make sure I took the photo of the animal like this. Um, um, and then I'd save it. And you can see from the ice cube tray that it's added the animal to the ice cube tray. So that's the entire process with all the horrible rigmarole attached to it. I'm not going to go through the entire app for my, for the future identifications. So the rest of this talk, I guess, is more about why animals are different and stuff. But I did, did just want to go through one um, long windedly just so that you'd seen it done. Going back to the home screen, if you do just want to identify an animal, you don't want to enter it into a sample. The button to hit is this one here, which says identify. And it brings up the options that we had previously. 
we might just use this for the worm. And I'll use the worm as a really, really easy way of demonstrating um, one of the other features of the app, which is a thing called Speedbug. Speedbug is basically, oh, hang on, what's happened there? Excuse me, I've lost. Speedbug is basically um, a water bug ID for cheats and charlatans. Um, it, it, it has very little um, in the way of formal taxonomic stuff embedded in it, except for the fact that I guess animals do look different, and that's probably all we're keying into. And, and what Speedbug has is all of the various um, silhouettes of your different animals, and they start off relatively simple towards the right, and then as you scroll the thing um, roulette wheel style towards the the sorry, left, and then you, as you scroll towards the right, you end up with more and more appendages hanging off your animals. So you can see they, they get more complicated that way and much, much simpler this way. So we're looking for a worm. And you can see one of the cool things about silhouettes is that if the, the silhouettes are generated from live animals, you get a lot of the posture characteristics um, showing up in the actual critter. So here we've got a leech, a nematode, and a Gordian worm. Gordian worms wildly different from any of the other ones simply because of their length, but also from the complexity and the tightness of the turns in the animal. And that's kind of what's being illustrated, I guess, in these things. And it is instantly, I, I would argue, quite apparent that this critter that we've got, the, the black chap that sort of goes pale towards um, his schnoz, um, is, is very much got this sort of set up here. So to ID it, we would just tap on that and it comes out as just a simple worm, oligo kick. Um, that's, that's perfectly fine as an ID. If we were to go through the app, we'd end up in a very, very, you know, we went through that section where it asked whether we had a head capsule or not. Probably at that juncture, we'd get sent off towards the worms and it would be a fairly rapid identification um, even with that. Cool. So, John, I've got a question for you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Does Google Lens work well for macroinvertebrates? Uh, not yet. So Google Lens works, I'm, solidly amazed by how well Google Lens works. Um, there's a, a bunch of beautiful geometric flowers out there that it'll do to species. There's a blue periwinkle I, I threw at it the other day and it, it got it to species level. But if you think about it, that's a very wonderfully geometric um, thing to throw at it. Um, one of the problems with a lot of these animals is that while they have recognizable postures, like I said before, they're not consistent postures. So to actually be getting the 50 million different wiggles that that worm could be doing and then matching them against the wiggle that is the worm ID in that app, that is slightly beyond the computing power, I guess, of Google um, Lens currently. Um, that's not to say that it won't get there. Um, uh, I, I used to be extremely cynical about these things and think that they would never work and it was okay. I would always have a job identifying bugs and they'd never do me out of a job. Um, but, you know, every day I get a little bit more worried about my ongoing employment as the, as the technology gets better and better. Um, all right. Um, what I'd like to do now is to have a crack at um, one of the animals that I've got from the river, because the river own animals, I guess something I should have said uh, before I started playing with the worms, um, is that when we're doing these IDs, um, it's, it's good to bear in mind that we're dealing with live animals and they are in a you know a droplet of water. And so they are effectively, while we're looking at them, sort of gently asphyxiating. And so if you don't put your finger out and ID them quick smart, um, there's the potential for them to cark it. And so I, what I'd like to do next, I guess, is to identify the, the more heavy breathing of the animals that I've got in spoons around it so that I can then release it at the end. And that way my five-year-old son won't guilt trip me later. Um, John, I've got another question. What's the yeah. furthest you can do with the uh, What's the furthest you can go with the orange wor red worm? So that particular red worm, sort of genus, I guess, is where we go. So we we get to statistically, if you've got them in front of you and they're bright red, there's a very good chance um, that you've got Coronamus, the genus, in front of you because it's 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 cosmopolitan, it's every bloody where, and there are usually in quite high abundances and they're extremely tolerant. Um, but it's one of those things, it's almost like a statistical ID, if you know what I mean. It's, it's a probability thing. You might also have um, one of the 15 other uh, Curran nominae, which also do red body, um, but are a lot rarer. So that's a possibility. And, and we've used that a little bit. Um, the actual list of potential genera 
um, that it could be are in the ALT keys, I think. If they're not, we should pull our fingers out and have them in there. Um, and we'll, that's one of our, our goals is to have every critter that's listed by species lined up against the ALT taxa that it, 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 um, it fits with. Um, does that sort of make sense, I think? Thank you. Uh, another question. What's the scale at the bottom of the screen? Um, they're centimetres, um, 10 millimetres in each, like in the rest of the world, particularly France. Great, Great thank you. Cool. Um, all right, so I guess the next idea I would like to do is on these two little chaps, and they are both, um, both my flyers. Once again, hiding behind the wrong things. And I guess the thing I'd like to point out while they're still doing it is that they have very different ways of moving. And you can see that the the, um, the chap on the right there is very much flattened out, a bit like a huntsman spider, and hunkered down close to the thing. And when disturbed, he tends to want to run or dolphin a little bit. Whereas the other chap, when disturbed, See the little legs going on him as he rests around? Whereas the other chap, when disturbed, will... Well, 20 minutes ago, when they were less exhausted, um, would swim away in bursts like a small fish. They might have a crack at that later on. Um, while we're looking at these things, um, it's probably worth pointing out that there's a little bit of damage in one of these... Actually, both of them are suffering a little bit. One of the main characters that we'll be using to identify these things is the number of tails or Circe on these things. Um, you can see that the bottom left chap has quite obviously got three, whereas the guy on the right there has one, a half a one, and a half a one. A half a half a one. But if you do a little bit of forensics on it, thinking backwards, it's very unlikely that they're going to have um, uh, a lack of symmetry in the beast and so you can sort of extrapolate out and go yes there would be three tails on this particular critter and so when we take it through the key we'll assume that it has three um often you'll find these animals in you know numbers of more than one and your little ice cube tray will have multiple examples so if you're worried at all about damaged animals um keying out incorrectly it's worth looking at multiples of the critter that you're trying to key out um all right so heading back to the app um and going on to do an ID. Um, I'm going to use the key again. I'm going to start by identifying the larger and flatter of the two animals. You can see that chap there. Um, so we go through the, the original um, loops again. And I apologize, these things become a little bit tedious after a while. Um, and I'll show you a trick with Speedbug in a second that allows you to dodge these endless, uh, you can imagine if you go through the same key every single time for an animal, the first, I don't know, 10, 15 questions will be the same for every, all of your insects because they've got to get to the same place in the key. And there are sort of ways you can use Speedbug to jump into the key at different spots where you're fairly confident you should be going. So animal without a shell, animal with legs. So we're going down a different spot now. Animal with more than eight legs. So one of the beautiful things about this particular critter is that he is standing still, he's quite large, and we can count his legs quite easy. So it, it quite easily. So with eight legs or less, um, he has six legs, which you can see. Um, with wing covers or with no wing covers, but possibly with wing buds. This guy's quite young, so he hasn't developed the wing buds just yet, but he very definitely doesn't have wing covers. He doesn't look like a beetle or a bug. So we go down this pathway here. No obvious tails versus obvious tails. We've got obvious tails. And do we have two tails or three tails? Um, despite the damage, we're pretty sure we have three. So we go this way. And then the options are tails flattened, leaf-like or broad, versus tails thin or round in cross-section. And so there's a sort of the difference between, I guess, a, a leaf-shaped structure or a structure more like a rat's tail or something along those lines. These chaps here um, at the top, that would be a damselfly if we had one of those. We're not going down that pathway. We're heading into the mayflies. Order level ID ephemeroptera. So we could go down that way and stop there. I'm going to try and do a, a much lower ID. Nymphs with gills along the sides of the abdomen. And you can see that those wonderful little leafy structures that the chap's flicking now, they are in pairs, and there's one pair on either side of each abdominal segment. So these wonderful, wonderful little structures that are uh, they're basically for absorbing oxygen, dissolved oxygen from the surrounding water. Um, so yeah, nymphs with gill covers or nymphs with gills. 
So our chap has obvious and visible gills rather than gill covers. Um, if it was to have gill covers, you wouldn't be able to see all these gills fluttering like that. There would be a single structure which would, would be much larger covering over the top of those and impairing your direct view of those gills. Um, and that's the same, that is how it is with the, the canids and, and some of the other groups. So we go nymphs with gills along the sides of the abdomen, like this. Um, robust, um, dark brown nymphs with alternating spiny V-shaped gills and small feathery gills. Well, there's simple sort of leaf-like structures on this chap, so we'll go not as above. Large nymphs with helmet-like heads, prominent eyes, two different types of gill. Well, as we can see from this one, the gills are fairly similar. They're both leaf-like, um, and so we'll go with not as above, head not helmet-like. Um, just to give you an idea of what they look like, sometimes it's worth nicking forwards in the key and having a bit of a squiz. You can see these chaps. Oops, I'll get my John. I uh, just to let you know we've lost the uh, the app uh, Thanks, video. Dude. Thanks. There we go. So um, you can see just from the it's very much a silhouette here, but you can see it's quite a distinctive beast. This one, and the head is not quite as square as our little friend here. It's quite a large, um, and, and they're very three D. These chaps. And the gills are a plate and a frilly thing um, alternating, whereas our chap has uh, leaf-like gills. So we assume it's not one of those. Head back into the key where we were before. And so we go, it's not one of those large um, chaps. It's not as above. Nymphs usually run rather than swim. So before um, you notice that he was moving his legs, um, you can see, I think the baited currently, oops, I've given it away. Um, the other chap now is, is trying to swim in bursts um, like that. So that's one of the ways of swimming. And the other way of swimming is with the legs all going, um, sort of like a huntsman spider, like I said before. So rather run, run rather than swim, rather than nymphs are fast swimmers. So the bottom is swimming nymphs. The top one is running nymphs, which is what we have for the large one. With a conspicuous set of horns, this chap has lovely antennae, but no horns. Gills fluffy, each one ending in many fingers. We've discussed them a number of times now. I've always referred to them as leaf-like because they are. They're not particularly fluffy. Fluffy looks like this, though, just to give you an idea. Um, can you sort of see that? You've got lots and lots and lots of little tendrils coming off it. So it's not fluffy like that. Go back, not as above. And here we are, um, a, an identification, which is for this particular animal, down at family level, not genus level. Um, as some of the other ones have been, and not order level like the amphipods were. It's somewhere in the middle there. It's a family level ID. Um, one of the cool things, I guess, about the, once again, is the video. So you get a bit of a chance for, to see how it moves. And hopefully that sort of corresponds okay with the way you saw it before. Okay. Going back to, um, so the other animal that we've got in this um, tray here, this little chap here, is noticeably quite similar. So I'd be happy if you were starting to think things like, oh, it's probably another mayfly because it's got the three tails. And as a result of that, I'd also be un totally and utterly understanding if you didn't want to go through all the very first front, front part of that key again. So one way you can avoid that is by um, lobbing into speedboat like this and then browsing through the critter list towards the right until you end up with all of your beasties that have three tails like this. So you can see this all of these animals here share a, a very, very similar sort of body plan. They've got the three tails and they've got sort of gills in some sort of combination. Can you, I hope you can, can you just, just about see the gills on the baited at the moment, the fellow down the bottom there? They're just fluttering, um, depending on the resolution your screens are picking it up, you may or may not be able to see that. Um, with a magnifying glass, you'd be able to see that they are little discs rather than little leaves. So they're a very different um, sort of setup. If I get to this stage in speedboat and I'm not entirely sure about the ID, what I can do is I can hit the not sure button, which is down the bottom there. So hitting not sure drops you into the key at the point where all the mayflies start to radiate off in different directions. So we, we avoid that, you know, maybe the first 10 questions or so and lob in straight where the mayflies are. And it's a good, good um, quick shortcut, I guess, if you want to get the idea of a mayfly, but you're pretty sure it's a mayfly already. Uh, Nymphs with gills alongside the abdomen. This is the same question we had before. Um, it does. They're little discs. They're slightly more subtle. It's not the robust dark brown nymphs with alternating spiny V-shaped gills. They're little discs, and he's not at all robust. He's quite a small, elegant little beastie. Oh, that's, I'm definitely going to go and pop these back in the cold water in the bucket in a, a minute or so. 
Um, you'll have to probably excuse me briefly where I race out and dump them once I've identified this animal. Uh, large nymphs, it's not one of those again. So if we go back to we're at this couplet here, which is where those two animals diverge from one another, I guess. Nymphs fast swimmers is what we're dealing with for the little chap. Um, I'll just move them around again so that you know what we're looking at. Little one there. So nymphs fast swimmers, yes. Uh, large nymphs up to 17 mil, um, not really. Here's your scale. Can you sort of see that um, alongside? So 17 mil would be, that's 10 mil at one there and 15 for the next notch along. So you can see it's considerably less than that. So small nymphs less than 10 mil. Uh, I guess the other characteristic in there is the really long antennae. So you can always, size characters can be tricky because you, all large animals started off life quite small. So you can imagine if you had one of the chaps that goes the other way, a large nymph up to 17 mil, when it is in its earlier stages, it might be less than 10 mil. So we have to have a backup character there. And the characteristic that we use is that the antennae are super long. So um, this chap has, you know, they're about half the body length of the animal there. So we go this way and just to double check it, here's a picture of a baited swimming in bursts, just to give you a bit of a feel for the motion. Poorly um, videographed, but there you go. Um, so that's that's the two mayflies. All right, I'm going to nick out and pop these ones on ice just so they don't die, and then we'll come back and I will finish with one final ID of um, several pyrexids or water boatmen, and then we'll call it a day. All right. So, oops, maybe if I have them in shot. So there are four, this is just out of the farm dam, so I'm quite happy with this. There's four, sorry, three different genera in this teaspoon, um, which is kind of cool. That sort of diversity in the Crixid isn't, you know, normal. Um, and the, the nice thing about having that many all in the same place is that you can actually, um, see why they're different from one another as opposed to if you find these animals one at a time you're always sort of beating yourself up a little bit about the fact that is it like that or what does it actually look like when it has those other characters and there's a tendency if you always get the same animal to get a bit bored and to try and um, shoehorn it into a different id just so that you get a bit of diversity i've done the same thing myself um, so actually seeing all the different critters side by side is actually quite nice one of the big characters that we use with the um the Corixids or the, um, the water boatman, is size. Um, and the, you can actually get away with that because by the time these chaps have their wings developed, they are uh, at their final life stage and they're not going to get any bigger at all. So we only identify um, mature adults in these things. You can see all three of these chaps have uh, their wings fully developed. And you can see that from the dark tops. Let's see if I can, is that bigger or closer? That's closer, isn't it? Okay, cool. I think I get more light on them too. Don't like that, do they? All right. So, um, one of the tricks for being able to actually look at these is to see if you can, um, if you're struggling to be able to see them because they're moving around too much, you can sometimes strand them in a bubble of water. Um, I think we're a bit lucky here. They are actually sitting still for periods of time. Um, if I was to use the app again, there, pop it into view so you don't have to guess what it is I'm looking at. Um, I'm going to use Speedbug to cheat just briefly again. Um, oh, yeah, I will because we're sort of running out of time. So the water bugs, sorry, the water boatmen all sort of come into this, you know, these are all hemiptera. They all swim roughly the right way up. And so I'll lob into the key at the point where they start to separate out. So larger bugs, 10 to 30 mil. Um, you can see most of these things are under 10 mil from the little scale bar that we had there before. So we go less than 10, we go this way. Head with nostrils or a celly, which are almost a bit like another set of eyes on the head. One of the cool things um, in this particular setup is that we do have um, one of these chaps in the mix here. He's just gone up the other end, but if you have a bit of a look at the larger of these, this is going to be a hard ask, I guess, with the resolution on the various monitors. 
But when he stops moving, hopefully you might be able to see two little dots just inside where the eyes are. There, can you see them? Just a little tiny dot just inside where the eye margin ends. And that is the character that allows us to identify this as uh, very four eyes or um, uh, Diaprepicorus baricephalus. So this is a, a species level ID just from being able to notice that dot on the inside of the eye there and the overall size of the critter. So that's that's quite a, uh, it's a relatively little effort to get a species level ID, I guess is where I'm going with that, which is quite nice. So assuming we didn't have that, so for example, we were dealing with um, the longer, thinner of the critters. Where is he there? Oh, that's not going to be so easy. So we'll go not as above and we'll see what falls out of the key next. So the segment after the head with distinctive stripes or bands. Now, depending on, um, I'll bring it back. I did see that just went off. Sorry, batteries are, are dying slowly. Um, so with this, ah, can you see the chap on the right? I'm sort of trying to track him towards the end of the spoon now. When he stops, you can see just behind the head, the pronotum has lovely stripes. Can everybody see those? Those stripes are indicative of the genus um, Cigara. This is Cigara here. And in, in my photo, you can sort of see that there's stripes as well. Although it's, it's equally difficult to see on both of those. Assuming you haven't got that, which is what we have with the little chap, um, you have to keep going in the key. You end up with a small boatman, less than four mil. And that is exactly what we're dealing with here. And it's kind of good to have a character that is size-based here because actually pointing out anything you may then have to go looking for would be kind of pointless on an animal this small. Because even with a magnifying glass, the little boatman, it's hard to kind of see everything. Um, so that is small boatman, micronectar. So all of the same genus. So that's a genus level identification. Um, I think we might call it a day there. I'm hoping that by going through those very different animals in the key, I've given you a bit of a feel for the, the pitfalls, I guess, in the, in the various IDs. And I've also given you a feel for how the app flows. Um, if you have trouble with it, feel free to get in contact through various channels, um, either through the National Water Bug Blitz type stuff or um, uh, other means i think i'm contactable through no, the national water bug blitz is the way to go so go through info at nationalwaterbugblitz.org.au um i'm not sure how to wrap these things up rich do you want to step in or do we have a question um, probably next isn't it yeah i've got a question for you john so with the one that you just identified i'm going to call it barry because i didn't get the the rest of the name I yep. think I get that one and one that looks very similar muddled up. Yeah, and okay. so you're saying it's where you've got the two eyes and then there's like that dot in between the eyes, almost yeah, like yeah. a bit, and that's the difference. Yeah, um, the other one that doesn't have the stripes, um, can you see in this picture here, you can see the absence of dot there. Yeah. Um, that one is probably the sort of thing that would turn up in your part of the world, and it's a grapto -carixa. and it's a larger a larger water boatman. Um, but then I guess Barry is quite large too. But uh, you'd be looking for the dot, not the dot, is the way you separated those two. Okay, great. Because I did some ID on that and I got the the one that you just said, the aggro. Agrato, yep. Yeah, thanks. Um, but somebody else ID'd it as Barry. So that's why I, I wasn't sure. Yeah, okay. It's mm. it's good to have, um, I guess one of the cool things about the app is that it forces you to take a photo. So um, we can have those arguments after the fact once we've got that set up, um, um, so long as the res on the photo is enough. And I'm finding that most of the modern cameras on phones are actually sufficient for even, even that sort of character, providing people put a bit of time in. Great, thank you. Um, I've been monitoring the chat. Um, okay, so another question's come through. Is there a very verification service available either part of the app or as the part of the wider program when there's ambiguity around macroinvertebrate identification? Absolutely. So when you uh, register as a user on the app um, and you submit a, a sample, I guess, um, uh, I 
go through the whole thing and verify all of the IDs because they have those photos against them. And then when you register, you register an email. And, and if things are, um, uh, are not lining up, we get back to you in an email. And the cool thing about the way the keys work is if you've said it's something and it's something else, if you think of that as a you know beautifully dendritic structure, there is only one point where you've got it wrong. Because you, you, if you imagine the line between the beginning of the key and the actual identification is this lovely linear path, you, there's only one spot where you can go wrong. So we will usually, so because of that, we can actually tell you where you've gone wrong and you can actually then take that on board um, and have another crack. Um, yeah, so there's definitely that. And uh, I'm open, like because that's an email contact, we'll, if you're not happy with that, we can back and forward a bit too. So often, you know, th these things need a bit more discussion and um, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to do that. Um, so yes, there is is a verification setup. If you aren't entering samples, um, we also do verification type stuff through, there's a Facebook thing called um, Waterbug Face. So feel free to log on to that and um, submit pics of animals you aren't so sure about through that. that and we, we get back to people on that within a couple of days usually too. And all of um, Another question, um, if uh, if somebody doesn't have a mobile, does the app work on a laptop? And how do you get a photo as good as doesn't. you've obviously taken? Um, these, most of the, so the photos, like the one on my app, on the app there, is actually taken in a tank with a professional camera. So that sort of scale of photo is, is beyond what we're expecting of people with the app. But I'm finding that the actual apps, if you're, you've got your beasties running around in a teaspoon, um, most modern phones, for the last five years even, have the resolution that you can stand the phone back a little bit and then zoom in and get reasonable macro shots um, with, with huge amounts of detail. Like that, most mobile phones nowadays sport 4K cameras if they're you know not budget budget versions. Um, so yeah, it's 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 not as hard as you think. Um, I'm also happy to chat to people if they want to make contact through the info at what about Blitz email if, if you want some guidance on how to take these shots. Um, we're thinking of putting up a, uh, a YouTube uh, video about it as well um, in the near future. So, Great. And what about a compact camera that would work well? Um, uh, probably not meant to flog particular cameras, but I'm going to anyway because there's nothing that competes with it really. Um, I I've always used uh, TGs in the field. So Olympus make a, a series of cameras called the TG56. What, I don't know what they're up to now. Well, the current ones are five. They are the only camera that's little tiny compact, has macro and goes totally underwater. And that combination is just absolutely winner for the sort of field work I do. So I can dunk it in a, in a river and actually get in situ shots of animals doing their day to day. Um, and it's got a little light at the front and the, the resolute, you know, it's, they're not awesome photos, but they're, it's amazing that you can get them, if that makes sense. Like the actual combination of having a macro camera that you can dunk underwater is, is just ridiculous. So the TG cameras are awesome for that. And John, for recording information of your data or for um, submitting it to the Waterbug Blitz, can you do that through the website itself or do you need the app to be able to record and submit the data? The app is the best way. Um, if you're part of the Melbourne Water um, Waterbug Census, you would probably do it through the portal that they have set up separately and possibly using data sheets. That are, depending on, you know, it, it entirely depends on what your program people accept as the data input. Another way that many people that are doing this will use is the uh, Water Watch Victoria um, also do ALT style data and they'll submit it either through their portal or through um, by filling out data sheets. And it all hopefully, well, it will currently all end up in the same space. And um, the week after next, when we have our chat about data, um, we'll have a bit of a look at where the, all this data ends up. Thanks. So there is an option if you don't have a smartphone, um, you can still do it through the Waterbug Blitz um, data portal. But yeah, the app is probably the easier option. It is. Um, Sue's got a question about um, how long people should be spending on the identifying process when you're doing one of these surveys. Um, until you get it right. <laughs> 
Um, that it's very much one of those things where the first time you sit down to do this, it's going to take a day, and it may become irritating. I'm, I had a there was an awesome site in the Upper Yarra that we did um, a whole bunch of training for. I think it was with your Melbourne Water people, and it was a really bad site to choose because it had you know upwards of thirty five critters, and each one of those IDs takes forever. And towards the end of it. Um, people were starting to tear their hair out a little bit because it, it does take a long time when you start. And then you'll find as you become familiar with the keys, you can sort of jump through them much more swiftly. So don't worry if it takes, you know, an hour and a half, two hours to see all the bits and be comfortable that you're getting the right thing in. Um, if you are sort of short of time uh, and you're using the app, there's a dodgy thing you can do, which I'm, I'm not going to recommend is the way you do everything. But um, if you photograph everything and put a name against everything, it doesn't matter if you get everything wrong, so long as you've got everything in the app. And I can go through and change the names later and get back to you with what they are. It's, it's really nice if it's not, you know, 80% of the animals and that you've tried on some of them. But so long as you've got pictures of everything that was in there, we can turn, you know, your attempts into an actual data point, so long as you've photographed everything. And um, someone's after the clar clarification of what the app is called. The app is called the Waterbuck app. Excellent. And free free to download, free to access. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, brilliant. Okay. Um, so it looks like we've we've gone through most of those questions there. Uh, if anyone has any last questions, now is the time to, to type it in furiously. Uh, otherwise, I might thank John very much for uh, joining us today and giving us such a great uh, presentation. Um, and thank you, everyone, for jumping in and uh, checking out uh, the the webinar today. We will we have this recorded. Um, I doubt that it will be up in the next couple of days or the next week, but we will endeavour to try and get it up online as soon as possible. We will send through an email to everyone that has registered for this, and you can also keep an eye on the page that we have set up for these uh, expert webinars on the Melbourne Water web page. Um, and maybe just one last question that comes through from Nick. Um, okay, so there's a uh, my problem is sampling technique. How can you scoop effectively without getting lots of mud in your net? Um, if you are in a particularly muddy spot and you're going to be sampling it again and again and again, it might almost be worth investing in a coarser net. Um, we've got a whole bunch of uh, videos on YouTube that are accessible through the National Waterbug Blitz uh, resources page. Um, there's this thing where you do, that you can do where rather than uh, shoveling with your net, you actually uh, create little circles in the water above um, the bit that you want to sample and the water currents themselves lift the organic matter and yes some of the mud but hopefully not as much of the mud into uh, the water column and then you rest the net through it and pick stuff up that way and that will minimize the amount of uh, fine seds that you get but it, it is definitely worth thinking about a, a, a different coarseness of, of net anything from 300 to 500 micron is is, is, a, is a good sort of way to go if you're if you're constantly sampling in places that have lots and lots of mud um yeah i'll ignore it. and the other thing you can do i guess is to have a if, if that's not an option you could have a sieve on site and just uh run fresh water through that um before you look at your samples i've done that before in areas that are absolutely horrible um and that allows you to have a little bit of clarity in the in the white tray once you finally get the sample into that excellent uh, well, I think we might wrap it up there. So thank you very much, John. Uh, and thanks again, everyone else that has jumped in today.